Hello, everybody. The upcoming September update for Risk of Rain 2 is going to be an important one. Not only is it bringing some cool new additions, at least on paper, such as Skills 2.0 and a returning survivor from the first game, we know it's not the minor, by the way, but also it's almost certain to give us some much needed balance changes, quality of life, and bug fixes. In my opinion, the new stuff isn't really going to decide how well the September update performs, as in how much it bolsters the game overall and attracts new or returning players, but rather the changes and tweaks to the already existing gameplay elements will be the focal point. Some of the things I'll talk about here range from being pet peeves to things that will drastically, and I do mean drastically, improve the run-to-run -run feelings of just, you know, playing the game. Now, I'll cover some things to do with in-game balance of items or monsters, but the main points will be related to the bigger picture things, as in things that do with the fun aspects of the game. There will be timestamps in the description for those of you who want my ideas on certain topics, and be warned, my explanations will definitely not be short. Let's get right into it, starting with the biggest change I'd like to see in the game, and that is charging the teleporter. The amount of downtime in the mid or later stages of a run is just boring. In the early game, it really isn't a big deal. There is rarely a time where I feel like charging the teleporter is either too hard or too easy, but once your run is in the later stages of the second loop, and sometimes even earlier than that, the majority of the time spent fighting things is with anything but the teleporter boss. You basically just activate the teleporter and have a resident sleeper waiting fest after killing the boss in under 10 seconds. The remaining 80 seconds is just spent wandering aimlessly around in a red circle, killing some random monsters as they spawn, maybe checking for one last chest you may have missed, and just more waiting around. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but they don't detract from the issue at large. Waiting to charge the teleporter in these situations just kills the momentum in a given run, and personally, I can't go for more than two hours or so before I just decide to obliterate from my five lunar coins and go again. The motivation to keep going is completely absent once you experience a god run the first few times, and it truly hinders the overall appeal of the game. Why would you keep playing if you just kill everything instantly and wait around in a red circle for 90 seconds every stage? How is that fun? Now, before you start typing, yes, there are quite a few aspects that would incentivize going as far as possible in runs, namely harder enemies, harder bosses, an actual final boss, and exclusive exclusive rewards and more like that. But a very easy starting point would be addressing the teleporter. So my proposed change would be something along the lines of, once the teleporter boss is dead, each monster you kill from then on adds a certain percentage to the charge. It could be 0.5%, 1%, or varied based on how many enemies you've killed. Or maybe something like, as soon as the boss is dead, you can opt to spawn another, which would give another random item until the charge is done at 100%. I don't know, just something to keep us engaged with the teleporter if it really does need to be a mechanic in the game. Or, you know, you could just remove the charge time entirely. Once you kill the boss, you can move on. I get that its function is by design. It's an artificial way to gate the difficulty of a run because no matter what, you are always waiting a minimum of 90 seconds to reach the next stage. There's no way around it. So long as you're in game and waiting, the difficulty is going up. So messing with the teleporter charge rates would affect the overall difficulty of the game. I get that. But as it stands, it's just boring. The only fun or interesting interactions with the teleporter happen when it's either a terrible location, such as in the caves of abyssal depths, or spawning a unique boss like the Grove Tender and Scorched Acres. What's going to grow this game ultimately is keeping us wanting to progress our runs, which is why I'm very hopeful for what seems to be the custom skins or appearance changes for your survivor in the coming update. You can see here these color palettes kind of look like shaders, and I'm assuming they can be unlocked from various means in game. If these boil down to simple microtransactions, I'd be in awe. I can almost guarantee there's some exclusive reward for playing a certain character, and I really hope they bolster the reasons to go for longer runs. Otherwise, we'll have to wait and see the specifics on unlocking these appearance modifiers and what else Hopu has planned for incentivizing long runs. Again, addressing long runs is going to be the major factor in the overall reception of the update, in my opinion. All right, let's move on here to another big change I'd like to see. And some of you are probably going to be surprised with this, but it's Lunar Coins. They're broken. Straight up, OP. No way around it. Allow me to clarify. It's not that the coins themselves are OP or even the drop rates or methods of acquisition, except for you dirty, dirty little text file editors, but rather it's what you can do with them. Accessing a blue portal pretty much whenever you want is the biggest reason for them being so good. Sure, getting any mix of four shaped glass, gestures, and tonics is quite strong and can definitely change your run for the better, but I'd argue the simple process of going to the Lunar Bazaar needs to be addressed. Buying those lunar items and getting a green and red item to print is just too much power to throw into a run, especially especially because it's at almost any point the player wants. Abandoned Aqueducts, Rally Point Delta, and Scorched Acres each have a guaranteed newt altar spawn, so at a bare minimum, you can spend one coin per loop to get into the bazaar. But chances are, one of the three possible spawns on every other stage will have an altar as well, meaning you can get one every stage in most situations. That's just too much. It should feel exciting to enter a blue portal because of its uniqueness and rarity. Now, if you're like me and don't ever have coins, getting a random blue portal is definitely a good feeling because I don't have to waste one of my hard-earned coins 
on buying it. But you know what's not a good feeling? Getting a random blue portal and having no coins to spend at all. Then entering and seeing a garbage green and red to trade into, or just simply being in the first two stages of a run and not having anything to print them with at all. So my proposed changes would be twofold. Number one, reduce the rate of entering blue portals by quite a bit. I'm not going to pretend I know exactly what's best for the game, so I won't even try spitballing some numbers, but reducing the spawn rate of newt altars at the very least should take place. Getting a blue portal should feel special every time. Number two, give the random blue portal spawns a minimum worth. So in cases where you have zero coins to spend, for example, you'd be able to acquire some coins through some sort of challenge during the teleporter event or something of the sort. Maybe making a blue teleporter event where every enemy you kill during the teleporter charge has a greatly increased chance of dropping a lunar coin, having both a minimum and maximum value of coins. So something like two coins minimum and maximum on the first stage, and then that maximum of two is increased by one for every additional stage. So on stage two, you can have a max of three coins from this event. Stage three, you can have four coins max, etc. Not only would this address the issue of not having coins to spend, but would also make the teleporter event much more engaging. Two birds with one stone, really. Also, adding a special event like this would balance out a reduced spawn rate of newt altars and enable some of the power to be shifted into this event. As in, you increase the chance at a random portal, which is now replaced by this hypothetical event, while simultaneously lowering the newt altar rates. Again, I'm not going to pretend like I know what's best for the game. I'm simply trying to offer some solutions rather than just sit here and complain the entire time, you know? The last topic I want to discuss here is specific item balance. We already know of the absolutely warranted nerf on guillotine, making them a green rarity instead of white, but there are some other items I'd like to see addressed in some way. I'm not going to cover everything I think needs some love, but here are the big ones. Number one, Wake of Vultures. Number two, the Halkion Seed, Happiest Mask, and Beetle Gland. Number three, the Aegis. And number four, the Red Whip. With Vultures, thematically, it's a cool item, but man, oh man, is the half HP conversion to energy shields a real downer. The best solution to this problem would be to remove the conversion entirely and make it a bonus to your HP like barrier is. You know what? Just make a barrier. End of story. As of now, I make sure to avoid picking this item up entirely because if you're in a run that is relying on healing to keep you alive, so pretty much every single run, getting half of your HP instantly turned into shields completely messes with one shot protection if you take a large hit right after the conversion because you can't leech or regen the shields like normal. So make it shields instead, give barrier. I grouped how Halkion Seed, Happiest Mask, and Beetle Gland together because they all have to do with the same problem, friendly AI. Now, where Halkion and Gland are just stupid AI, Happiest Mask's AI take it to a whole different level because they can kill you. Yes, your own ghost can, for seemingly no reason at all, end up damaging you and ending your run. I understand the Clay Dune Strider ghosts do this by design, and that's not what I'm talking about here. If you've ever died and been like, uh, what? Hey, excuse me? And have seen your own portrait as the culprit, it's the Happiest Mask. And on a side note, if there is no cause of death listed at all, it was the environment hazard, like an exploding clay pot or barrels on stages two and three, which is why I don't pick up the frost relic. But the fact remains, friendly AI needs some love and especially when they try to kill you. Again, they're cool items by design, but at best, the units they spawn just seem to get in the way and at worst, well, I don't have to say it again, they kill you. Now, the reason I included these items specifically is because they're unique, either being red or yellow rarity, meaning they're much more difficult to get your hands on in a given run and absolutely need to reflect their rarity with their power. Give them some love, Hopu, come on. Speaking of the rarity to power relationship, we have the Aegis. This is easily the most disappointing red to me. It's not that it doesn't function as it should, like the others we've talked about, but rather it's entirely outclassed by a white item, Topaz Brooch. I'd even go as far to say that a single Topaz Brooch provides a better bonus to your overall power than Aegis does. That's right, one stack of a common item is better than a legendary. Not only will you rarely be overhealing at any point before like stage 7 or 8, but its cap is at 20% of your HP, and the barrier it provides is always decreasing. It's just baffling how bad this item is. I vastly vastly overestimated its usefulness in the item and equipment tier list because we hadn't had experience with anything to do with the barrier stat. So I thought, hey, it must be better than the Topaz brooch, which already seems pretty good because Aegis is a red and brooch is a white, correct? Uh, no, no, I was very wrong. If you didn't know, the reason why a single brooch is better than Aegis is because they both add to your barrier stat. They are functionally doing the exact same thing. The difference is that brooch, number one, has no cap to its value and number two is up much more frequently because all you have to do is kill stuff. You have to be at full HP before before the Aegis even starts its effect. Then you have to stay at full HP while you overheal and keep that healing going until you're at a whopping 20% of your HP. Woo! Then it just stays at 20% at best, and at worst, trickles back down until no barrier is remaining. Like, come on, did you guys accidentally mix up which item received which effect before the update? Like, is Broach supposed to be the current Aegis and vice versa? Anyway, please give Aegis some love because, again, it is a red item. Finally here, the infamous Red Whip. Again, I could have picked quite a few more items to discuss, but the Red Whip is by far the most annoying. The issue is that anything you do that is related to combat will cancel its effect. That means if you're playing Mercenary and using your Shift and or R to get around, as you 
should. It doesn't matter if those abilities hit something, they will always cancel the effect of the whip. If you take any damage, shoot any ability or do anything related to combat, the whip cancels. The solution is simple. Make its effect out of danger rather than out of combat, similar to how the cautious slug functions. Out of danger would mean that the only way its effect cancels is when you take damage. You can move around and shoot freely and get the movement speed bonus as long as you don't take damage. Either be it from taking too large a fall or, you know, getting hit by an enemy. Red whip in its current state is simply frustrating beyond belief, no other words. All right, and that does it with the changes I think the September update needs to address in one way or another. There are bound to be some disagreements and definitely some conversation at the very least, so please leave your comments below. I read them all, I promise. And in the sake of full transparency, I was recently monetized by YouTube, meaning there will now be ads playing on my videos. My current idea is if the video is 13 minutes or longer, I'll put in one ad in the middle, so around seven or eight minutes, as well as putting an ad at both the beginning and end of every video. I figured this is a good balance of income for me, as this is actually what I'm pursuing for a career, as well as respect for you all. I don't want to bombard you guys with ads. Also, I don't know about you guys, but I have a uh, magical way of never seeing ads for some reason there must be some weird bug with my windows install or something i don't know man no but really please let me know if the ads are unbearable and i will adjust when and where i place them accordingly you can check my live stream out over at twitch.tv slash wooly gaming where i stream risk of rain 2 on a regular <coughs> semi-regular basis <laughs> and also consider joining our discord server i always announce when i go live on twitch or upload a new video here on youtube on the discord server so if you want those notifications and more such as a place to find people to play the game head on over to our server links to both my twitch and our discord are down below thank you for watching Watching.